We cannot hear you. Dr. Ronald, um, could you please unmute and introduce yourself to our participants? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm called Dr. Ronald Amey, uh, an intern at Guerra General Hospital in Casasa uh, yeah. District, and I'm the case presenter for today. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ronald. Um, so we are going to move on to our next uh, part of this uh, agenda, which are going to the pre-test. We have some pre-tests that we'd like to check with knowledge as we start this uh, discussion of people and children. There are some questions we'd like to, to check if you understand it as we, before we start uh, the, the presentations. We are going to set up and put up the pre-tests. Um, as we are doing the pretest, uh, maybe um, any person in the chat you can tell us what your expectations of this discussion could be um, as we as we all fill in the pretest. Please let us endeavor to do the pretest that we can be able to to check ourselves before we start, and then we can see after the session where we are. Anyone online uh, planning to, to discuss with us any of their expectations? Yes, yes, um, yes, um, yes, we would like to, to um, hear any expectations as we write the pitches, any expectations from the participants online. What we expect from this um, from this session? And we can also put uh, any other right expectations in the chat, or you can unmute and tell us some of the expectations.
Um, thank you very much, Jackson, for your for sending in your expectation. And like I was saying, Jackson is hoping to understand the different favorable conditions and to be helped by our panelists today on how to best manage them. And I think that is one of the expectations we are hoping to, to clear out today. Yes. Any other expectations can keep coming through. You can either unmute and talk to us, or like Jackson, send something in the, the, the chat as we are doing the pre test. I can see some familiar names on. Um, I can see Justin Nabukera. This is a colleague of mine. If you have any particular expectations you can share with us, it would be good. Yes, um, there's Oscar uh, hoping to understand how best we can deal with the privileged, um, uh, with the privileged patients who who come to us um, uh, that uh, asking us to treat their children in a particular way when they come with a particular fever, with a fever to to our healthcare facilities. Um, Oscar here also would like to understand any new changes in the management that has happened. And that is one of the expectations. So changes in management of a fever in a child. Uh, Mr. Simon Enoch would also want to understand the key laboratory investigations done in children with a fever. And this is also one of the, of the goals we want to tackle today when we are discussing uh, this fever in children. Yeah. Yes, another person, Benjamin, would also want to understand with the BS that is positive and an MRDT that is negative, you would like to understand uh, the difference uh, between these two. Uh, I see Jonathan is having a similar expectation with the, the earlier expectations of the different causes of fever. And uh, most of these we are going to understand, we are, uh, we are going to tackle them with the different panelists. And also Moses hopes to know uh, any updates in the malaria treatment, any particular changes that we are having in the malaria treatment. Yes, Huntington has a similar one for me for uh, how to manage uh, the index of suspicion for for newborns, malaria in newborns, the, the neonatal age. So our pretest is over. Um, you can see those are the, the 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 results that are coming in. So yes, keep all those 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 in 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 your mind. We can move on to the next part of our agenda. Would uh, invite Dr. Ronald to present to us the case of discussion today. Um, we shall have a case presentation from Dr. Ronald. Dr. Ronald, you can you can prepare to present to us the case. Uh, thank you so much for the time you've given me. I hope I'm loud and clear. Yes, you are loud and clear. I hope everyone can see my screen. Please confirm with me if you can see. We yes, yes, we can see it. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, we can see screen. So, uh, without wasting time, let me go straight to the points. Uh, I'm called Dr. Ronald Amen, an intern doctor at Vera uh, Hospital, and I'm presenting a case uh, of a child who presented in with uh, fever uh, in our pediatric unit and was managed from here. Uh, got discharged yesterday evening. 
So, uh, MA, two and a half year old female, uh, recovered from a peripheral facility here in Kasese, uh, came in with a four day history of uh, fevers that was accompanied by vomiting, loss of appetite, and there were associated uh, convulsions, and eventually the child uh, lost consciousness. And the caretakers reported that uh, these symptoms had been preceded by a one day history of dry cough. However, they did not take the child to the hospital because they thought it was a cough causing the fevers. So uh, at the time of uh, admission at Guerra General Hospital, uh, this child had not been feeding for two days and had no feeding tube. And the caretakers had reported that the child had uh, a tea-colored urine. However, when we admitted, uh, the urine was clear. So uh, we went ahead to manage this child has an emergency condition at our unit. Uh, mind you, we don't have an, an ICU here, so we did whatever we could in our capacity. So uh, we checked the airway, and since the child was unconscious, was unable to support the neck. So to avoid the risk of aspiration, we put in the lateral recumbent position. Then uh, when we checked for the uh, breathing, uh, there was a chest rise uh, on both sides of the chest equally. And uh, the child was saturating at 86% on room air uh, with reduced air entry in the right lung bases and crackles were also heard in the right upper lobes uh, of the lungs. Uh, as, an, as an intervention, we went ahead to put on oxygen by nasal prongs, flow two liters per minute, after which the child improved and saturation was, was at 97%. Uh, in the saturation that we assessed, the child was tachycardic with a pulse of 134, that was full volume, regular, and the capillary refill was less than two seconds and the peripheries were still warm. Uh, we couldn't uh, take the blood pressure because we didn't have a pediatric cuff uh, in the vicinity at the moment. And we also noted that the child had moderate pallor. So uh, in preparation, we took uh, blood for uh, CBC grouping and cross-matching and we initiated the child on uh, IV maintenance fluids according to the body weight. Then uh, when we assessed the glasgocoma scale, the child was, uh, had reduced level of consciousness with a GCS of 8, was only opening eyes in response to pain, uh, and also was having uh, incomprehensible sounds and would withdraw the limbs uh, in response to pain. So we still maintained her in the lateral recumbent position. And on exposure, there were no injuries detected. Uh, so uh, we did a quick assessment uh, on admission, and we noted that the child had had fevers uh, for four days. That started as mild and intermittent before worsening. And the fevers were followed by multiple episodes of generalized tonic-clonic convulsions with frothing and stool and urine incontinence. And thereafter, there was a loss of consciousness. Uh, the caretakers also reported that they noted that the urine output had reduced and the urine was still colored in nature. However, there was no associated facial puffiness, and at the time of admission, uh, the urine was clear. Uh, child uh, had also one episode of uh, vomiting that had started around the same time the fever started. It was non bilas and non projectile, and was followed by reduced appetite. With all this happening, they also reported that the child had had one day history of uh, dry cough. So uh, we noted there were no, in, in our sample assessment, we also noted that there was, uh, there was no history of food or drug allergies. And at the time we received these patients, uh, they had been referred from a peripheral facility and had been initiated an IV atesonate and ceftriaxone and had also been given oral carbamazepine and paracetamol, which we are not sure how it was administered, considering that the child didn't have a nasogastric tube and was unconscious. Uh, the, this was, uh, in the past medical history, it was the index admission for such symptoms. And uh, in the last meal, the child had eaten two days prior to admission at the peripheral facility. That was the last normal meal they had. However, the family members had been trying to give the child oral sips despite the child being unconscious. Uh, there were no, uh, in the events, there were no traumatic events or aura that had uh, preceded these symptoms. 
So our problem list, uh, what we had to deal with uh, on arrival, we had, uh, there was fever, uh, convulsions, uh, a feeding failure to feed, uh, then uh, reduced urine output, and also possibility of aspiration pneumonia. So uh, we went ahead to do uh, rapid investigations at arrival since uh, the, uh, the child was unconscious. Before doing this RBS, we had uh, given the child a bolus of, uh, we had given a child a bolus of uh, D10, uh, 55 mils. Then after some time, when we got the RBS strips, that's when we did uh, this random blood sugar. Uh, the MRDT was uh, positive. Uh, at the, in the emergency room, so we took a sample for uh, blood smear also. Then uh, in the course of the management, we did a complete blood count whereby we noticed the hemoglobin was uh, 5.6. However, in relation to uh, the level of the pallor, uh, it wasn't very coordinating. So we decided to do a repeat uh, HP estimation uh, using hemoglobin only. That gave us a value of uh, 7.6. Child also had reduced platelets uh, of 82. However, there was no bleeding and was blood group uh, B plus. So uh, our management of this child uh, uh, with the positive uh, blood smear and we, we concluded that this child had uh, severe malaria and that was already complicated with many things, including cerebral malaria in view of the convulsions that we had and the loss of consciousness, and also could have probably had uh, an acute kidney injury, considering what the caretakers reported that had reduced urine output that had initially been uh, decolored. So we gave, uh, by at, at, at the time of admission, uh, the child had already been initiated on IV atesonate from a peripheral facility. So we finished uh, the last, uh, the dose of the atesonate they had initiated. Uh, then we proceeded to continue uh, with the second dose of uh, our IV atesonate, uh, after which our blood uh, smear result turned out negative. Then uh, when the blood smear turned out negative, we initiated the child on quartan, one tablet, twice a day, for three days uh, since it was uh, the, the drug available much as we had loved to initiate on uh, dihydroatomicin and piperacrine. So uh, we also supported, uh, we also gave supportive management to this child. Uh, uh, at the time they reached, we gave, uh, the fevers were high, so we started on rectal paracetamol that we were giving 125 milligrams eight hourly. And this, we also accompanied it with uh, tepid sponging using warm water. Then uh, because there was a, uh, because we suspected aspiration in view of the crackles we had on the chest, we also initiated uh, the child on IV metronidazole and gentamicin. Uh, for the convulsions, we gave two doses of diazepam, which did not manage to calm down the seizures. So we went ahead to give a loading dose of phenobarbital and then maintained at 55 milligrams till the seizures had resolved. We also calculated our maintenance fluids and gave at uh, uh, one liter of uh, Ringer's lactate uh, over 24 hours till the child had recovered, regained consciousness and was able to feed by mouth. And uh, at admission, as I said earlier, we had given uh, IV, D10, 55 mils. Then uh, we also kept the child on oxygen by nasochrome since uh, they were desaturating on room air. And we had decided to insert a urinary catheter to monitor the urine output. However, we couldn't uh, get the right size. So uh, in the follow-up of this patient, uh, on admission, the patient uh, was responding only to pain and was febrile. And we inserted a feeding tube immediately. So as we continued our treatment, uh, on 27th, the child started responding to voice and on 28th, the fevers had subsided and our blood smear had turned out uh, negative. The saturation had also improved of oxygen, so we wind off oxygen. However, because uh, we couldn't uh, access any uh, blood for transfusion, we opted to start the child on uh, hemophot syrup and folic acid. Then uh, 
By 29, the child was stable, however, was still pale. Uh, with uh, the GCS of 15 over 15 was able to feed and the grapples on the chest were clearing. So by 30th, the child was able to walk around the ward and would play normally, there was a smile on the face. So uh, on 31st, uh, before discharge, we still did a repeat uh, blood smear, which turned out negative. So we sent the child back home on a quartem, uh, one tablet, uh, PD, and we advised them to continue with the folic acid and the hemoport for two weeks. And also we advised them to come for review after the hemoport and folic acid. We also noted that the vitals were stable with a pulse of 115, uh, normal temperature, temperature within normal limits and was saturating well of oxygen. Thank you so much. That was the case we managed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ronald, thank you so much for that case presentation. Um, now we would like to, to get any reactions. The case we have just presented to you, um, you can direct it to Dr. Ronald. There are some that are already, that are already on the chat. Uh, someone was asking how we were administering this ringer's lactate. They would like to understand the dose intervals that we use to give this ringer's lactate. Uh, so, uh, is it okay to give my reactions? Hello. Yes, Dr. Ronald, I can make a comment about the dosing intervals that had been asked. So, uh, yeah, let me respond to some of the questions. So for the, for the fluids that we were giving, the ringer's lactate, uh, since we didn't have uh, an infusion pump, uh, we just calculated uh, the 24-hour dose and we kept... Uh, giving using uh, a biuret. We tried to regulate it tightly to ensure that we didn't uh, overload this child, considering that we were also not very certain whether our kidneys were doing very well. However, we monitored also for the signs of fluid overload in the process. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ronald. Um, Mr. Frey Nwagawa would also like to, to to understand your dosing plan for the metronidazole that we use. Yeah, so for, for the metronidazole, when we calculated using the 
the the weight per kilogram it was uh, supposed to be uh, 200 uh, milligrams uh, given uh, eight hourly however we admit the dose was uh, slightly exceeded thank you yes thank you so much um, someone in the had, had commented if they they they'd wanted to speak their reactions i know if they are still online Yes, I'm available. Yes, please go ahead. It's finished. Uh, a good afternoon, team and team Echo. Uh, thank you, Doc, for the presentation. I have a few concerns. One is uh, we need uh, clarity on uh, the quantitative and uh, qualitative malaria screening approaches. Because uh, in your presentation, you indicated that the BS was positive. I do understand that a BS can be used for a quantitative measure. I think it would be very good if you gave us how many MPs were seen per field, according to the person that was behind the microscope. Then two is about the SPO2 of 86 that you had on admission, but you did not uh, record the respiratory rate. So was the patient desaturating on room air and had the normal respiratory rates per minute, or was the child also touch, I mean, touch punic and it was also an eye catcher for you? The third one is uh, the initiation of oral meds after IVs. You had like a six days duration with this patient. And in the last slide, you indicate that the patient had a, a clear BS at day 28, I mean on the 28th. And then you saw that you gave oral meds on the 31st. So was the child just being monitored on the 26th and 30th? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ronald, would you like to comment to any of our panelists who can chip in uh, to, to this? Yeah, uh, so, uh, you... Let me comment on the, the questions. Uh, so uh, when this patient came in, first of all, they had uh, reported a positive uh, blood smear from the peripheral facility. Uh, However, they didn't give us the exact value. Two, when we did a, re a repeat uh, blood smear here, uh, the person behind the microscope saw uh, 20 parasites. However, uh, in the event that uh, this child had features of, uh, features of uh, complicated malaria, like uh, cerebral malaria and a possible acute kidney injury, we had to initiate on the treatment for uh, severe malaria. That is, we had to continue with our assessment. Then uh, thirdly, uh, when, the, when we finished our assessment uh, immediately, we initiated this child on the oral quartem. The last dose was, the, the final dose was actually on the day of discharge. So the child was supposed to take the last dose on the evening when she was at home. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Ronald, for those reactions. Most of the questions online are actually regarding the topics we are going to discuss with our panelists. So I think we shall keep those to the to our panelists um, just uh, to 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 keep us reminded. They are asking about uh, the nursing care with tepid sponging whether we use cold water or hot water, what is the recommended and the, the, the different uh, recommendations for treatment that uh, are currently being used. So I think we shall move on to the next session of discussing about what are the common causes of this fever, the fever in a child. And this will be by Prof. Chiguli Sara, and you're welcome. I, I had a question on, on the same presentation. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, we can keep those questions, just keep sending them into the chat. 
Um, as the professor explaining, is setting up the presentation, yes? Okay, thank you very much. And once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope I'll be able to, to share something and also for us to, to go through. Uh, the first thing we are going to go through today is to discuss some, some common causes of fever in children. Uh, I can see you are not able to, to see my screen. Are you able to look at it? Okay, that's good. So fever in children is, is really common. It's one of the commonest symptoms and there are many causes of fever in children that we should think about. Uh, what I'm projecting comes from uh, hospital pediatrics and it's given very simply. This is a book that you can always look up for yourself. But fever in children is mainly due to infection and many of these infections may have a localizing signs so that when you examine, you can know what causes it. Others, you see fever and you may not pick any localizing signs. Some children present with a rash, but also some fevers uh, have a short duration and others uh, last for long. So in our, most of our communities that are endemic for malaria, we should think of malaria as one of the commonest causes of fever in the children that we see. Uh, people who live in non-endemic areas for malaria, of course, should not take this as the first differential. But for us, we think about malaria, uh, and as we go later on in investigations, it's always supported by uh, positive tests, the parasites on BS, the RRDT we talked about, and signs on clinical examination. Infections can also be bacterial. Uh, bacterial infection uh, are also common in children. And I think we many times abuse this infection uh, when we say bacteremia or uh, infection, but they are common and many times they present in the different parts of the body, uh, as we shall see. Typhoid fever or enteric fever, another bacterial infection that causes fever. These children are usually very seriously ill. Uh, and in my <laughs> very many years of practice in pediatrics, more than half my age, <laughs> I've been with children. I've not seen many children with enteric fever or typhoid, but they're usually very sick, very weak. and. Uh, a blood culture is usually positive, but also that fever is usually long uh, duration. Urinary tract infection is common in children. So we should think about a UTI in a child with fever. If they're a bit older, they'll have abdominal pain. They may have pain on passing urine or cry when they are infants, when they are passing urine. <laughs> that is if they, they are not in pampas <laughs> where you may not know. But uh, a common mother would, would tell you this child when passing during the child cries, uh, and those are some of the pointing uh, uh, signs. Of course, in HIV children, it will have fever because of a number of uh, infections that may occur, uh, associated infections. But fever can also have be due to other infections in other parts of the body with localizing features. So the sepsemia I talked about, the bacteremia, if it's in the meninges, then we have meningitis. So we should always look for signs of meningeal irritation in children who have fever. Because these children don't come and say, look here, I have meningitis, I have malaria. So you need to examine them. Ear infection, otitis media is really common. So we should always look at the eardrums of these children. We should look for uh, evidence of pus from the ears and also ear pain. If there is pain in the ears, the child will cry. Or if they are older, they will say it. And if they are infants, they will not sleep at night. And this can be complicated by the mastoiditis and you normally get tenderness behind the, the ear. So bone infections, osteomyelitis, 
the joints can also be affected. So these are infections elsewhere. So when you examine, you can be able to say that the fever is because of this. Acute rheumatic fever is common or can be common, especially in children five to 15 years. And unfortunately, we don't normally detect it. Usually that fever is longer than seven days, but also there are other signs of uh, no, idea, yeah? And this follows a throat infection. Uh, so, so many causes, but before I end, uh, I'll talk about pneumonia or chest infection or respiratory tract infections as a whole, from the ear infections, throat infections, but also pneumonia. And later on, we shall see how to look for this. Viral infections are usually common and they present with a skin rash, red eyes, a red mouth. Uh, but in fever in children, we should also think about what if a child has treatment or you are giving the treatment and this child has a fever for more than seven days, for more than 10 days, what should you think of? We should then think of other causes, tuberculosis can really be common. So let's think about TB. Let's think about uh, uh, other, it could be malignancies in children and other causes, but as I end, let's think about common things occurring commonly, malaria. And if there's no evidence of malaria, someone put in the chat, what if this malaria, which is not, the, the BS is negative. Yeah. So if there's no evidence on laboratory investigations, then it's not malaria. Think about something else. And if the CBC doesn't point to a bacterial infection, it could be something else. So depending on what you find from the history, from the clinical futures and the investigations, then you, you think about what else it could be. Uh, so I think I'll stop there with the common causes of fever amongst children. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yes, um, we shall still, still with Paul, we shall move on to the the investigations uh, to do in this child who is having a fever. And I think during uh, Professor's uh, presentation, most of our comments in the chat are being talked about, people asking about fever of unknown origin, having a fever for more than 10 to 20 days. I see you, Sophia, mentioned that the other child similar having a fever, but uh, eventually they found out it to be a dengue fever eventually. So I think uh, what Pope is saying, you investigate for the other causes that are not the usual causes that we have been treating and thinking about. And we can move on to the assessment and the investigations in a child with a fever. Okay, thank you very much. And my presentation is going to be, I hope, simple. But this is something that I think works, uh, irrespective of where we are. And I'm going to give two in one. One is if you are a lower health facility, if you are in a clinic, if you are in a health center, two, three, even four, but also if you are in an outpatient department in a hospital and the child comes in with a history of fever, how would you approach the assessment of this child? The guidelines I'm using is the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness Guideline, IMNCI, we used to call it IMCI. <laughs> I like to tell stories. I was trained in IMCI then in 1996, because some of you were born. <laughs> and we are some of the first people to be trained in the whole world, but back. So in any child presenting to, to a facility, and this time the presentation is fever, we should ask the parent, what is the problem? And if the mother says the child is fever, and uh, actually fever can be, by history, she says the child has been feeling hot. You need to, to get it because fever means many things to many people. But here we are meaning the child is hot. You can touch and the child will actually feel hot, but also taking a temperature auxiliary and it's more than 37.5 or 37.5 and above. That's what I mean by fever. And this child presents for the first time. So before we do anything, these guidelines tell us that you look for general danger signs, 
signs that tell you that this child may actually have a serious illness, even if the presentation is fever, the parent says fever. So quickly you ask, is the child able to drink or breastfeed? Uh, is the child vomiting everything? Does the child vomit everything that you put in, whatever goes in, comes out? Uh, has the child had convulsions during this illness? And sometimes the child actually may be convulsing at that time. So if a child has any of those four signs, we say that child has a general danger sign and this child actually has potentially a very serious illness and you need to quickly assess, give any peripheral treatment and then refer this child. I think this is important because many times that mother says fever and before someone asks, they are writing for what time or they are putting up an IV line for something, go home. But it's good to, to guide and any of us can use this. And then you ask about the symptoms that are commonest in children. So you have to assess in a holistic approach. Even if it is fever, you ask about the main symptoms that account or which more than 70% of children present with. So the first one is cough or difficult breathing. Has the child, has the child got a cough or difficulty breathing? And if the answer is yes, then you assess as above. Okay, for how long you count the breaths in one minute to see if there's fast breathing. Uh, you look for chest in drawing, you look for wheezing. So the reason for this is because we said pneumonia or respiratory tract infections are common causes of fever. So you want to, to say, is this the problem? And you rule it out. And if it is, there's no cough, there's no reason for you to go further. And in cases there, I use these guidelines to classify and manage. I'm a bit fast because of that time. And then you still ask, does the child have diarrhea? Because diarrhea could be a manifestation of a viral illness, which can also present with fever. But then if a child has diarrhea, you need to, to, to assess for dehydration and correct it if it's there. You need to find out, is there blood in the stool? Meaning, is this dysentery? So that you treat it with an antibiotic. And the child with dysentery can also present with a fever. But also, if this diarrhea has been there for more than 14 days, then we say it's persistent. You also manage it. Uh, and then you go, then you further assess the fever. You ask for how long. Has it been there every day? Usually malaria is there, but it is on and off. But if that fever has been there in every day for more than seven days, then you think of maybe something else yeah. uh, or malaria. And then you ask the, for the presence of measles within the last three months. It could be measles or a complication of measles. The beauty is that we have less measles now. And then you examine for a stiff neck, we already said that meningitis can cause yes. fever. Uh, and then you look for running nose, which usually shows a respiratory tract infection. And then you, use, you look for any other causes of fever. That's when you ask, is there pain on passing urine? Is there uh, ear pain? What else has the child had? And then uh, you also look for a rash, which could be viral. And then you classify. I won't go into detail, but this is uh, an algorithm that we can share with you so that you look at it. And using that algorithm, if a child has fever, it is there and had a convulsions, then you think it is beyond the normal malaria. If there's a stiff neck, then maybe it is meningitis. Uh, and then you ask, does the child have an ear problem? We say ear infections can commonly present with fever, but if you don't treat them, then they can persist, they can become chronic, and this child can even lose the hearing. So here you look for, for ear pain, you look for discharge. So this algorithm tries to assess the common causes of fever that I talked about. 
to give you evidence in a simple way. But later on, it also helps you to trick them if you go further. But you know, you don't stop there. Even if the present, present before plant is fever, assess for malnutrition, don't let an undernourished child go home without you addressing malnutrition. Because it's not only the fever. If you do, this child will come back with severe malnutrition in a few weeks. So you assess for nutrition, for malnutrition. And if you find that it's severe, the child tells you how to do. And if it is not, it also tells you how to handle it. You check for anemia. Because we know that many children may have anemia, iron deficiency, other causes, but also the malaria, if it's malaria, can also contribute to the anemia. And then uh, you check uh, for HIV, and uh, you also check for TB. We talked about TB. So that's why I love this algorithm. I've not gone into detail, but I think I thought that I should share so that you can reuse it simple thing and anyone even may can look at it but before i end you also need to assess for nutrition uh, for immunization status it doesn't help to treat fever and the child is not immunized and comes back with a vaccine but uh, immunization of a vaccine preventable disease uh so i'll stop there but i also have another follow-up presentation bear with me because i want to share with you then what if the child is at, uh, has been referred, like the one presented? What if you are in another facility then? What, how would you assess? And I won't uh, take so long. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, so if you are at a hospital, if a child has been referred, you will also assess, okay. Is this what I want? Probably not. Let me stop sharing and then I'll share again. So if you're at a, a, a hospital, if you are at a referral unit, usually the children who end here are more sick. They've been referred, some have been referred. Others walk in, uh, but there I would recommend that when you're assessing, you start by assessing for signs of severe disease, the ABCD. You assess the airway, you assess the breathing, and if there are signs of airway obstruction, if the child, the way the child is breathing, central cyanosis, severe social distress, then you manage the airway uh, and the management is there. So instead of starting for how long, when I come car, what, I tell, are you married, how many children, <laughs> you need to identify a very severely sick child who may have an emergency sign. So the AB, breathing, uh, saturation, look for cold extremities, uh, look for a rapid pulse, look for capillary flow more than three, three, three seconds. Okay, and if any of those, the AO breathing has are not being projected, no slides. Yes, there are no slides because I'm looking for them now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm looking for the slides so that I can project. Uh, and if I get them, then I'll be able to project. Uh, but I'm failing to, to, get, to get the slide. It is this one that I don't like. That is it. I can see it. OK. Can you see something now? No? Uh, Not yet. Okay. Let me project since you love the slides. <laughs> uh, but I'll talk still, and then it will be easier for me when I'm projecting so that you see what I want you to see. Uh, I was with the ABC. Uh, so after the, the, the ABC, then you go to the D. Uh, disability, and you check for if the child alert, does the child have, uh, what is the level of consciousness? I've seen it, but now I'm, I want to look for the page. So you bear with me. Uh, and maybe we can go on and I will be able to get it as I go along. So then it, 
If a child doesn't have any emergency sign, then you look for what we call priority sign. Remember the child came with fever, but we are starting with the ABC. Then we are chasing if those emergency signs are not there, are there any what we call priority signs? And I'll get the charts later, very soon. And if there are no priority signs, it means the child can wait in the line for longer. If a child has an emergency sign, it means you need to assess immediately. In acute care unit, sometimes it's a market, but in that market, you need to triage and find out the most sick child so that you give most attention, the attention, but also it needs you to work with that nurse, to work as a team to resuscitate. I will be there soon. Uh, and then, so it is after stabilizing and making sure that the child doesn't have any emergency that you go into detail, take her history, uh, examine, and then get a diagnosis and then manage. But as you are doing the assessment of the ABC, sometimes you do investigations that are emergency, a blood slide, or RDT, HB, uh, a CBC, blood glucose. Uh, so we're almost there. Sorry about this. I think uh, I need to get it. And then from there, you can make a diagnosis. So there are some hands up. Maybe I can get that question as I look for for the things that I'm supposed to show. Yes, uh, as Asira Ignatius has a question, you have your hand up. Uh, as Prof is uh, looking for that, I think Ignatius can ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the presenters, and I hope I'm audible. As Asira Ignatius, I'm an intern doctor at Buera Hospital in Kasese, and Prof is my teacher from Makere. Uh, Prof, I had two questions. One in relation to malaria, I understand that um, malaria is um, has for a long time been a, a bad news for us, uh, the health workers in regards to fever in children. Uh, but uh, when the um, uh, BS which the presenter talked about, there's a negative BS. Could you please repeat your question from the start? <clears throat> I'm saying uh, there's a negative BS, especially in a country like Uganda, which is endemic, completely rule out uh, malaria. Uh, in other words, when I see a negative BS, should I immediately block off a, a, a differential of malaria? <clears throat> and I think of others. And then uh, secondly, and then secondly, uh, I have seen that uh, post-discharge uh, prophylaxis after the dosage for those kid, children with severe malaria, uh, giving them a prophylaxis for like six months of coatium has go gotten good results. What does Prof uh, say about it uh, in prevention of future further uh, recurrences and complications? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ignatius. So there's a negative piece complete rot of malaria. So the guidelines say that if the PS is negative, you can do the RDT. And if the rapid diagnosis test is negative, I think to get malaria. But you can repeat the test. It doesn't have to be one, repeat it. But if I do a test and you repeat it and still negative, let's not think about malaria. Let's not say you're not negative. Let's Let's not, and if the BS is negative, the RDT is negative, please don't think about malaria. Because the BS can be negative, because we know that the parasites released in the blood is, is, is not there all the time. Uh, so they are released intermittently. So you can catch them, uh, or you may not, that's why we repeat. Whereas the RDT means there's, there's infection or there's been infection. So if the BS is negative, the RDT is negative, it's not malaria. But also the RDT can be positive if a child has been successfully treated. Uh, so then that is where you are, so you know why you are doing it. But also a child with malaria doesn't mean that that child may not have something else. 
In fact, a big proportion of children with malaria also have bacteremia. They have other infections. So, so look for other causes of the fever and manage them. And if you are giving out malaria and the child, they are okay. Yeah. On, and if you have uh, other causes of, mm, mm, if you, you are giving out malaria, the right dose, and the child continues to fight a fever, think of something else. It may not be malaria. So, uh, well, we're still on that. Uh, and now we're asking about the, the diagnosis that is usually made of clinical, clinical malaria, where you have uh, the negative VS, the negative RDT. And I think you have just talked to that uh, about. The child is sick, but the lab tests that we have done, the PS, the RRT are negative, and someone is going to treat as clinical malaria. We should not treat as clinical malaria in Uganda today. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, when I was an uh, intern doctor, I've never been an intern doctor, and I said, oh, we could, but now we have the RRT, and hopefully we are able to do a blast fight forever. I, I get sad when we are not. And the guidelines say that you should confirm malaria before you give. As malaria. So there should be evidence. That's why these are the pictures have come in. Uh, oh, can you see my, my presentation now? No. Or not yet? I, pre I wanted to. Okay, I wanted to show you that algorithm and then I'll come where I start with the A and, and the B and the C and the D. Uh, there are so many things happening, so I'll leave it like as that. But these algorithms are there, so anyone can go and look for them. It's so easy, and these checks are very easy to do. Check for the emergency signs. Because I've seen junior doctors or students, the child is busy convulsing or the child is unconscious, and you are busy taking a history for the, for the next 40 minutes, even senior doctors. Whereas if you went through this ABC, handled the emergency, resuscitated, then this child will be able to survive. And you do this in order to reduce deaths for these children. Reduce mortality, but you push on. Thank you so much. For, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for simplifying for us using those algorithms that uh, that break down how to approach the child with a fever and reminding us to actually look for the localizing sites of these different fevers. That if we have looked for the common thing that occur commonly, we must look for those other diagnoses that we don't routinely think about. Thank you so much for that and uh, for the questions. I don't know if there are any further questions, but one of them, someone wanted to know the interaction between a CBC and the malaria diagnosis. But uh, from what you've said, that someone can have a malaria, but also have a bacteremia. They can have a white, raised white cell count. So um, someone was asking about a relationship between the CBC and the malaria uh, diagnosis. Yeah, and also, <clears throat> I've seen children with this IV lines they are playing around with them, and they are saying the child has a bacteria. And when you look at the CBC, the cells are not raised. It's a normal CBC, but also with a high CBC, let's also look look at the differential diagnosis. The differentials it could be viral, it could point to a viral illness, but also let's go back and do blood cultures if we can. Let's examine the urine in children. Uh, we may be able to get it. Uh, the hands up. Yes. Um. Yes. At this time, we shall move forward to to Mrs. Annette, um, where we shall discuss the nursing care in this child with the fever. We shall continue with the discussion later on, after after the end of the presentations. You're welcome, Mrs. Recording in progress. Well, I'm going to discuss the nursing care or management of a child with fever. Uh, 
Okay, just a moment. Uh, first of all, what is fever? This I would identify, I would define fever as a medical condition which presents with uncontrolled elevated body temperature, uh, in particular, at the temperature measuring above 37.5. So, our goals here would be to attain and maintain normal body temperature ranges for this particular child and then prevent complications that may result from an uncontrolled fever. Also, focus on finding out the primary or the underlying cause of a fever. After, um, after finding out the cause, manage the underlying cause and then be sure to allay anxiety. So, uh, how would we assess this particular child who presents with fever? Nursing assessment involves subjective data and objective data. In subjective data, we would uh, focus on taking a quick history of the presenting complaint. Take this history from a mother and the caretaker assess with evening with a child. So do not, just like Professor highlighted, do not linger asking about where do you stay. Those things can always be caught up with much later when the baby or the child has attained a more stable condition. So take the biographic data of the child, such as the name, age, gender, immunization history, um, brief surgical history, find out if this child has had past surgeries, medical history, if they have had a previous admission, if they have um, chronic illnesses running within the family, such as sickle cell, and then family history, briefly, just to rule out any genetic conditions, I beg your pardon, and then social history. Find out that like, this would include the lifestyle of this child, how have their feeding patterns, um, are they able to, how they feed, if it's a breastfeeding child, if it's, um, if they are having replacement feeding, that's what would be involved. And then, objectively, perform a quick physical exam from head to toe. We shall look at how, where we emphasize, since we have to, we are supposed to do a very quick exam. So, you can also do a review of systems. We shall see that later, what you look at. Back to fo our focus is looking out for danger signs in this particular child who presents with a fever. And then look out for signs of serious illness. Uh, just like Alia mentioned, detailed assessment can be done when the baby has attained a more stable state. Okay. Let's remind ourselves of the danger signs Prof has just taken us through. Let's just re-echo. Inability to feed or failure to feed. This involves breastfeeding. Don't neglect the breastfeeding age. Uh, even if a child is on NG tube, I'll give an example of an extreme preterm who is uh, having tube feeding. Actually, I've seen a baby who vomits everything on tube feeding. So severe uh, well convulsions. Lethargy, unconsciousness, and the fever, which we have, which is our major focus today. Then serious signs of illness that you would look out for: tachycardia, uh, tachyponia, and a diminished SpO2 of equal to less than ninety percent. Signs of shock: heart murmurs, signs of dehydration. Bulging fontanelles in young children, uh, stiff neck, diminished urine output. So, uh, well, that will be our center of focus in the brief or quick assessment of this child. Why do we do this? So that we do not lose a child while we, while we focus on things that can come in much later. Well, in the central nervous system, we say we'll do a review of systems. 
we would look at the uh, if this child cautious, the unkosher, okay, well, level of cautiousness, just to rule out altered cautiousness, you would look out for, uh, find out if they're in pain, cardiovascular system, do their vital signs, very key, heart rate, if you're able to auscultate, listen to their heart sounds, is it, is it regular? Is there a regularity? Uh, is it strong? To rule out those particular things that would uh, communicate something right on time. And then look at their perfusion. Are they well perfused? Do they have both extremities? Uh, capillary refill, is it good? Is it less than two to three seconds? Respiratory system. Quickly see, are they are having signs of respiratory distress, the nasal flaring? Um, please let's, this is, uh, let's refrain from this habit of counting respiratory rate of 15 yeah. seconds, yeah. then you multiply by four. Yeah. That, is very, that is very wrong. It doesn't give the respiratory rate of foundation. Oh, where our focus is today in, in the presentation. So rule out uh, signs of labored breathing such as intercostal recession or chest in growing. If you're able to auscultate, rule out uh, uh, wheezing, uh, strider, those things. And then, uh, well, gastrointestinal system, we would um, Quickly, quickly examine her abdomen. So, uh, is it is it distended? Rule out organomegaly. Find out if they're able to be, find out if they're able to pass out to normally. Yes, uh, genital urinary tract urine output. First thing, and then musculoskeletal system. Think of things like um, muscle tone. Are they able to actively move limbs in younger children? Yes. So after you've had a brief review of systems, we would go ahead to, to draw a care plan for this particular child. So uh, when you're planning for management, the plan will depend on the identified problem list or the list identified in this particular child. Focus on the things that are life-threatening. First things first, ABC approach. Uh, much as it's an emergency, be sure to attain informed consent uh, from the mine, I mean from the major, because we're dealing with children, you cannot get consent from a child. Call for help. Why do we call for help? to enhance promptness so that we have teamwork and that's why we work as a team so that everything is done within yeah. time. You may not be able to accomplish a lot in the shortest, in the shortest time possible when you're doing it all by yourself. Consider ABC approach. Professor Sarah has just taken us through that. Um, inform the doctor on call, inform the pediatrician. I'm looking at this particular point in the sense of teamwork. You know, the same person who is, let's say, looking for an IV line at the same time calling, you know. Uh, here I'm looking at a scenario, uh, like a higher level facility, whereby you're working with a, a whole, as a whole team. So inform the, the pediatrician, inform the team on the ward, why? To ensure continuity of care, to avoid delays, the delays compromise outcomes. We all know that. So vital observations. This comes among the first things. Why? Because they will guide. They will guide from what you have noticed from the history. Actually, they would guide whether the child needs oxygen therapy, whether they are dehydrated. So they would guide on the first things first, whether they need um, antipyretics, Vital observation, we're talking about temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate, and then the blood pressure. Only do this if you have an appropriate pediatric BP cuff. Establish an IV line. This is very key in uh, children, which 
or who present with dehydration to prevent complications such as acute kidney injury. So secure an IV access with IV fluids. Uh, take off blood samples for investigations. So uh, give a child oxygen therapy if you have identified that they need it, depending or based on what you have taken from the history, what you have observed and examined. And then group blood products if required, just like we had earlier said, our management is going to depend on the identified problem list. Then monitor fluid input and output. That was a general plan or management care plan in general. So implementation and anxiety. When we are dealing with children, we don't only focus on the patient alone. Remember to always involve the caretaker or the parents, the mother or the guardian, the major. So allay anxiety, this is very paramount to achieve our desired plans or whatsoever we have plans to implement. So, okay, we have already seen that most of these things, I don't think I need to echo them. Still, okay, let me emphasize the, the samples that you take off. In a fever, in young children or pediatrics generally, even other patients, think about taking off samples such as a CRP, a CBC, RBS, a BS, and then MRDT, grouping, post match. Yes, those are the, the tests that you would think of. Well, well, well. So we'd also think of supportive care, such as pain relief, comfort, and then we would think of an NG tube if a patient is unconscious, if they are not able to feed, and then ensure IPC practices, infection prevention and control. Many times we neglect this, yet it's very key. Hand hygiene, you can use a hand washing facility, you can use the um, alcohol hand rub. That's, this is, there is this habit I usually observe in most facilities. Someone wears gloves and then they, they move from one patient to the other to the other. That is so selfish. Let's disease from that. Let's change gloves in between patient and care so that we don't do more harm or so that we don't add on to the problems or issues that the patients would have come with to the health facility. Uh, prevent injury, PI mean complications. Uh, give a health talk. By health talk, we say we need to involve the caretakers. They need to know what's happening, what's up, management plan. I'm looking at the whole, the whole let's say, hospital stay oh, one, one, one point at a time. This is an ongoing or continuous process. So when they know what's happening and what's expected and what our plan is, is like, remember actually most of our information, we also get it from the caretaker or the parents. So the more information you avail them with about the child, the better. Actually, when you've taught them a lot about the patient's uh, particular condition, they'll be able to identify some of those danger signs before you even ask, they will get back to you. And Okay, let's look at, that was a, a setting of a high level facility. Let's see what happens in case we have a baby or a child in a primary level setting or a low resource setting. All children with high fever should be managed from a well-established health facility. Why? for proper investigation and management. Remember in these low resource settings, you may not have some of the things, let's say blood products, let's say you're not able to run some tests. So it's best to refer them on time or ahead of time, instead of first mismanaging that particular child, when they get into a more complex state, then you think of referring. Let's also insist from that. So in the, Pre-referral care, we would uh, do a quick assessment 
Assessment remains the same, just like earlier presented. Uh, that involves history, taking a quick exam, and then this is to guide us, and then uh, rule out a problem list or find out whatsoever is happening to this child or to draw a diagnosis. Be sure to take vital observations and then give pre-referral treatment only if it's appropriate. Um, there is this habit of giving antimalarials in every child that presents or every patient that presents with a fever. That is wrong, we have already, that has already been highlighted. Even there is a lot of antibiotic abuse. So I would fear if I say it's more of the danger signs. Let's keep things simple. If the child is um, having a fever, a high grade fever, high grade I mean 38.8, I mean 0.5, pardon me, and above, given people giving an antipyretic like paracetamol. Uh, if the child has a low grade fever, it's about 37.5. Don't I don't think they would uh, really benefit much from antipyretics. So you'd think of other means such as uh, reducing excessive blankets, um, what we call exposure, tepid sponging. Tepid sponging, now this should be warm with warm water. Uh, avoid using cold, cold water. Why this does not really benefit the child, it predisposes them to getting ending up with hypos hypothermia. It's not really helpful. Uh, well, I would also point out on the dehydration. If you're able to get an IV access, well and good. Give an IV, give IV fluids. Now, in a client or a patient, oh, I'm so used to clients. Okay, in a child where you're not able to establish an IV line, you can put or insert an NG tube or even an orogastric tube. It can correct dehydration before we think of referral. Remember, I say we first look out for danger signs. These are life threatening signs. So, in the low resource set, low resource set uh, pardon me, in a low resource setting, focus on finding out the signs, um, manage them or control them, then refer the child in a more stable state. Okay, and then remember to properly document all that you have that has been done. So that's in the referral site, I mean, in the higher level facility, they know what has been given, what has not been given, what has been done, so that they know where exactly to start from. And then the take home note, uh, let's all always remember that antipyretics do not prevent febrile convulsions. Do not give empiric antibiotic treatment that has already been mentioned earlier. And then ensure parental involvement and health education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Annette. It was a very elaborate presentation. Thank you so much. Um, most of the things have actually been uh, answered. Most of the questions that have been in the chat, people had wanted us to be reminded on the priority signs, which we have done, because I remember there was a slide that had the priority signs. Now we shall move on to the management of severe malaria with the professor, and then we can have the full discussion at the end after the presentations. Okay. Thank you very much. And I hope I will not take a lot of time so that we can answer the questions. Maybe before I start that, <laughs> the nasogastric tube is really important in children uh, who are not able to feed or who have challenges with taking in. So to me, if a child is not dehydrated, I would not give IV fluids. But that NG tube is good because you can give food, you can also give other foods. And also what was said about don't use cold water. They become cold and they become hot. And the mothers tell you the whole night I was putting on it where it in your go. So the whole night, and it's true, but if you use lukewarm, hmm, lukewarm, then it's fine. Back to severe malaria, 
So usually due to PFAS param, and it's life-threatening, it's life-threatening condition. Uh, and we know that malaria is back. We are seeing more malaria now, and we are seeing more severe cases in children. Normally, children deteriorate over a few hours, even days. And if you have a child with fever or third level of consciousness, uh, they move into coma following a convulsion. And sometimes before they go into deep coma, they may just be very weak, unable to feed, and then the convulsions. I think about severe malaria, as you can see there. So, uh, and may, sometimes the children may have convulsions, and also usually the coma is there, and it's usually a uh, deep, deep coma. Uh, the, the labs, it's important that you assess the level of consciousness, and you should put in a nasogastric tube to minimize uh, aspiration. Minimize aspiration. Of course, we talked about keeping the airway open and also uh, putting in the recovery position. Check for hypoglycemia, the child who presents like the one that was presented, fever, loss of consciousness. Check for, for hypoglycemia and correct it. So do, a, a, what do they call that? Rapid, the RB, RBS, yeah, random blood sugar. sugar. And if you cannot, then you need to give glucose yeah. and you need to give dextrose. And if you don't have the IV, the NG tube and the sugar water, are extremely important. Treat convulsions, okay? With rectal diazepam, it's easy. And uh, because if the child is convulsing, then you cannot start putting up an IV line. Hmm? It will be funny, but the rectal diazepam is really very helpful. Uh, and don't give antibiotics to prevent convulsions. Eh? So they don't help you only give if the child has uh, convulsions and maybe if they are there more. And then you start the treatment with antimalarials. And we've already been told that if there's hyperpyrexia, give paracetamol. Avoid NSAIDs, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Sometimes we use them to reduce the fever, diclofema. Mm -hmm. It can predispose children to getting acute kidney injury. So paracetamol is actually very good. And, and you do the others, uh, tepid sponging is if, if possible. And then the, the, the other investigations that we should think about, uh, we've talked about the random blood sugar. We've talked about confirming that it's malaria. Uh, therefore, uh, do the blood smear and count the parasites. There's a question that came, if the lab you have is able to do it, and also, if you cite hyperparastemia, if more than 20% are parasites of the arabices or uh, beyond a certain number. Uh, it's important to confirm the CBC. The HB is extremely important because severe malaria can also present with severe anemia, especially uh, in young children who may have uh, anemia already. Uh, and triparasparum, Parasites a big number of, of, of arabices. And if the HB is less than 5%, 5 grams per deciliter, that's the indication for transfusion. Don't transfuse any seven, whatever, don't. Uh, and you can transfuse with either whole blood or packed cells. Actually, there's no difference. In fact, it might be better to transfuse with whole blood because the child gets other benefits. Uh, they can have a, a lactose, lactic acidosis with high blood lactate. I think normally we're not able to do it. Uh, and also, if you are in a setting that can do liver fun renal function tests, you can have serum creatinine that is uh, elevated. Uh, the role of the lumbar puncture, the way that children present fever, convulsions, loss of consciousness. It could be a severe malaria, but it could also be 
meningitis, even even in these children. So the lumbar puncture is extremely important in these children throughout meningeal uh, meningitis. And, and normally, before we can rule it out, we actually prescribe both antimalarials and antibiotics, especially if you're in a referral center. So the lumbar puncture is extremely important. I know these days, health workers, we don't want to do lumbar punctures. I don't know whether we don't know how to do them or the parents say no. But if you explain to these parents, they will know why you want to do it and it will be in their interest. Uh, and if the, you suspect severe malaria, the initial BS is negative, do the RDT. Uh, and also if available, it's usually available. If it is positive, then treat for severe malaria. I think that answers uh, the question we had about if both are negative, then probably malaria is unlikely. All these are not my words, by the way. <laughs> they are in this small book that I'm referring to. So in the treatment, we start with the ABC. So you, you do manage the emergency signs in the first one hour. Uh, and also we talked about treating hypoglycemia, convulsions and all that. The definite treatment is uh, the atemetha, okay? Uh, and uh, the treatment is atesonate. I think that's what we use. And I think it is two to four milligrams per kg IV. Okay, and you give it uh, at admission 12 hours, 24 hours, and daily until when the child is able to take orally, and then you switch to, to oral medication. Okay, and if you, can, you cannot give it IV for any reason, you can do IM, uh, you can also do rectal adjustment. Quinine, I think it's not the first dose in Uganda, but you should know that doses. Sometimes we've had children at the national referral where the response to atemeda was not good, and they responded to quinine. Actually, with malaria, we have a, a long way to go, but please start with the It reduces the temperature very fast. Uh, and maybe I should tell you that me, I worked when chloroquine was still on the... <laughs> and it was a very good drug. <laughs> it was a very good drug. So the drugs are there. The first line is a tesonate. Uh, and, and also give paracetamol if the children have a high fever, as we've been told. Make sure that the children are supported. The nursing care is very important, especially when they are unconscious. Make sure that the children are feeding, therefore the tube, the fluid requirements, Calculate them, don't give, over give IV fluids. In fact, in our first trial, we found that the giving excessive fluids, but also <coughs> rapidly can cause more harm, cause more death. Uh, don't give corticosteroids. These days, people want to give steroids. I don't know what, where that came from. Let's not give that. And if a child has any complications like dehydration, manage it. I talked about malaria. Uh, if they are unconscious, treat them. If they are in coma, let's treat them. But also, there's a role for doing a blood culture, especially before we give antibiotics at admission. They have this high fever. You suspect they also have sepsis. Let's take off blood for culture before we give antibiotics uh, to these children. I think I should stop here. Severe malaria, anemia we talked about. Uh, and we know that those whole blood, 20 mils per kg, uh, pack cells, 10 mils per kg. We found that many times children may need more, more transfusions, uh, but the important thing is to know when to start and also to know what to look for. Let's not over transfuse. And if they're in shock, let's treat that shock. I think I'll stop here and welcome any, any questions. Yes, if they, are in lack, if they have lactate acidosis, they are breathing very fast. The breathing can tell you that they are in lactate acidosis. Oxygen would be okay, but also the fluids 
and the blood transfusion in case they are anemic will correct the lactic acidosis most of the time. As pressure pneumonia, uh, the oxygen, and I'm not a fan of, on, of, of, of metronidus, uh, but maybe someone will tell us why it is given. Uh, I see it being given a lot. Uh, I don't know. I'll stop there with management of severe malaria. Of course, each of the topics we talked about can last an hour. In short, let's not forget the supportive treatment and the specific. Let's the doctors and the nurses work together to manage these children. In some places, the nurses are there, the doctor, especially public uh, places. So let's all be there. But also, let's not give treatment which is not needed. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, dear panelists, for that presentation. Um, most of the questions in the in the in the chat have actually been tackled, especially about uh, antipyretics, whether we use diclofenac or we will use paracetamol. Now, I think it's quite clear because with the the, the NSAIDs, we shall risk injuring this child's kidney. And I think someone in the comments also said that the nurse should be the check for the doctor, that sometimes the doctor just writes the, the medication and the, the nurse should be more, more vigilant to remind the doctor of when something could be harmful to the child. Yes, so I, yeah. And you need to, to that communication is, is, is really important. And some, I've, I've worked in the high-end hospitals where the, the nurses may not be as proactive I've also worked where the nurse will tell you, but me, professor, me, doctor, I think it is this and this. And when they say you, you listen, but you should work together, together, to get a plan. But also let's use the guidelines because we don't have everything in the head. And for children, the weights are very important because this child may, may need a different dose. Uh, but I'll stop there and wait for questions. Yes, we can now go into the question. For malaria in the neonates, yes. newborns normally don't have malaria. In fact, any fever in the, uh, or a child less than two months, let's think about sepsis. The infections are the commonest causes of fever. They could be general sepsis. It could also be localized and found out that they have a pneumonia, they have a meningitis. So a blood culture is extremely important. A lumbar puncture should also be done because 30% of the newborns with infection also have meningitis. Malaria it should not be number one, okay? From three months, you can think about malaria, but malaria should not be the number one diagnosis in a newborn with a fever. And we did not go through the logarithms for newborns, but it is all there in the literature. Yes, thank you so much. Um, now it's a session for more questions. Uh, we, can, we can send more of those questions through our chat, or you can unmute and ask us. Um, we, we shall do that over about uh, five to ten minutes, and then we can. So any, now this is time for questions or to our panelists and to, 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 to clarify some of the things that have not come out very clearly about fever in the child. There's a comment that nurses are not able to write a referral letter. I don't know who said that. Yes. Um, Degretary, I don't know <laughs> if it was us or. No, if... no, it wasn't. Okay. It was one of the participants. Mm. You know, we should work together as health professionals, but also when managing fever, there's a role for managing this fever in the community. Imagine that child who gets a fever at night or on a Sunday when the facility is locked. So community management of fever is actually there. Mm -hmm. And there are community health workers that are trained to give treatment immediately so that these children don't get complications. Alex, your hand is up. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, the dosing for uh, coatem. Uh, I've seen some some doctors prescribe uh, coatem, 
Uh, the first two doses, they give it uh, eight hours after giving uh, IV artesunate. I don't know whether that should, is, is the right prescription for coatum after the IV treatment. They give eight hours for the first two doses, then they continue uh, BD. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll take a number of comments. Benjamin. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I, I wanted to find out why in some cases you treat a patient for malaria, but when you repeat a BS, the BS is still positive, yet you Benjamin, that was not clear. Could you please repeat your question? So did you get it? Uh, I think Benjamin was asking about uh, the treatment for, for what else? Why some doctors prescribe a date hourly, others talk about after IV at the moment. The question is, mm. There are some instances whereby some patients, even if they complete a dose of attestionate, they remain testing uh, positive with a BS. So I wanted to find out what could have gone wrong for such patients. Because when you repeat a BS even uh, three consecutive times, you find a BS is positive. Even when someone has even started a continuous oral treatment, Thank you. Okay. Benjamin, can you please mute? Nathan, I think we've handled those. Nathan, your hand is up. Yes, yes good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Nathan. I'm an emergency nurse in Ghana. I really appreciate being part of this program so much. Uh, yes, so especially talking about uh, getting a lab result positive, either MRT or from the accounts before treating is the same thing here. Uh, and especially if any facility tries to treat based on the presenting complaints, you do so at your own risk since the health insurance will not pay. Uh -huh. So we are faced with that challenge. But uh, some clinicians will rather prefer advising the parents or the patient to buy the anti-malaria outside, even though the count or the MRDT is negative. Uh, and sometimes it works for them to uh, also intake on that. Over. Okay. okay, thank you. We shall answer those questions. Uh, so the one that doesn't go for what I IV at the unit, I think that guidelines are very clear how often we should give the uh, for after giving IV at the unit. And my simple request is that let's follow the guidelines. Let's put the guidelines up. Let's, them, let's have them on our phones so that we use them and we do the right thing. Let's not do the right thing. Uh, but also sometimes there's no need to give the IV attestment in the first place and, and we do it. So let's, let's do the right thing and do the right dose. Not giving the right dose may be one reason why the children or why the, the, the parasites don't clear. But I think uh, we should give until when you completed that treatment before you say that the parasites have not, have not cleared. Uh, some, yes, sometimes they clear first, but let's first complete the dose of uh, the first line and malarials uh, before we say they are not clearing. And in some few cases, some cases of resistance have been found, but I don't think that in our environment we have uh, monitored a lot. That's why we still have it as, as the first line. Uh, so why do some doctors prescribe anti-malarials even when the BS and the RDT is negative? That is bad practice, which we should discourage. I don't know if 
you had any questions or you want to say anything, maybe as we end, uh, we can take one more question. Okay. Yeah, we can take. So the link to the guidelines, I will give them to yeah. to the chair so that they will be shared. But if you, yeah, I will because they they are available and it is good that you have them. Yes. These are very important documents. Very simple. Very easy to use. Yes, we can have two more questions from Frederick and Andrew, and then we can close the Q&A session. Okay. This is Andrew Chamba. Yes, please, Andrew, go ahead. For me, I think mine is not a question, but it's just a question. Yes, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. So, Andrew, your concern? My concern is some of us we use other DTs from different manufacturers. And at the end of the day, we don't follow the instructions from the manufacturer, and we just some people just put in the blood and they end up having wrong results or false negatives or false positives. For me, I think that is one of the causes someone who can manage. That's why people are still managing malaria clinically. But if you fall, some of those guidelines sometimes you can get better results and you manage according to the guidelines. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that is very good. Let's follow, uh, do things correctly, including the RDTs and the BS. <laughs> and you know, some people will say that BS is positive and it's not even positive. So it goes up to that level. So we should all learn how to do a BS. And sometimes if that BS is consistently positive and you've given a, te, a te method, the doses and all that, you can switch to quinine. There are actually guidelines on how you can switch from ant, one ant malaria to the second line in case uh, you have challenges that you are describing. The patients are there, I've also seen a few, but the majority they'll have clearance of the parasites with the first line. So there's a role of, of another drug and quinine infusion is actually the second line in our environment uh, if a child has severe malaria. Uh, please don't fear to do the lumbar puncture, don't fear coning. Mm? Because if we the health workers fear coning, what will happen? Uh, let's not fear coning. And if there are signs of increased intracranial pressure, they, they will be there. But even in cerebral malaria, you can do a lumbar puncture. The needles we use are actually very, very small needles. Uh, but since we have that in mind, we should be aware, but we need to do the lumbar punctures. There was one person, I think it is Chilavo. Mm. Frederick. Frederick. Yes. Then we close. Frederick. Thin smear, yes, it is also very good. It is important. Yes. Thin, let, me, let me say this. The thin blood smear is important uh, so that we see which kind of parasites, but it also tells us many things. Uh, but because you can think it's malaria and it could be parasites, but you can see other abnormal cells, cells but you can also see immature cells so that the patient has a routine. Please go ahead. Okay, my concern was about what you shared about the those children below two months of age. Uh, in the rural setting, I've, I've come across uh, those children who are below two months and they have turned positive for malaria. The BS is positive, and to my surprise, it is, it is happening. So maybe my concern was about you to share about more the management of such of such children who are too young and they are turning up positive for malaria. You know, two months, yes, and I did not say that you cannot have malaria there. I said you need to think about sepsis. Uh, I also know that we've got studies have been done in Uganda where even congenital malaria, but it's not so common. I've seen children coming with disabilities and the doctor gave an anti-malaria this one day old, that one week old with a fever. So yes, let's have a high suspicion of sepsis 
but also if you are able to document that is malaria, please treat it. But it should not be the first thing that you think about. You know, diseases don't read books, uh, but it is us to interpret what we find. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, we, shall, we shall end there with the Q&A session. Our post test is up. Let us keep uh, answering the questions. This topic is very exciting. I'm still very many people keep wanting to discuss, but because of the time, we cannot really go uh, all the way. Thank you so much, our dear panelists, for your dissemination of the knowledge. <laughs> we are very grateful. Uh, let us answer the post test. Yeah, sorry. Did you get the link to the INNCI You cannot see the post test. It is up, yeah. it's up and running. And uh, we shall be able to send it. The CPD link has been changed, sent. Uh, we can use it for those who need uh, to register their CPD points. And also the different links that have been shared by our panelists will be sent to us that we can uh, think of them first, they will be, they will be sent to us. Please ensure to do the post test. Please resend, we are not seeing it. The post test, you mean? Yes. They could, uh, in case you can't see the post test, uh, please go under polls. Uh, you see it, uh, it will come up on your screen. More than 250, okay, we are 285. Please ensure to, to, to do the post test. Yes, we can we can make our final final remarks to the, the, the different participants from our panelists. We can start with you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone that took time to be part of this. Uh, let's put whatsoever we have shared into practice. Let's always aim at saving life, doing first things first, and setting priorities. Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like first to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to share the little I, I have learned over the many or few years with you, but also everyone who has been on. Uh, thank you very much. 
fever is a wide topic and whatever we're discussing was wide. Probably my own remarks is that there's a lot of information right there, which is accessible to us these days. Let's use it. Let's use the guidelines that are there. It will help us uh, do the right thing, especially in children who will range from zero day to 12 years or even more. So let's use the guidelines. It, it will make our work easier but also help us to get better outcomes. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, our dear panelists. Uh, one of my take homes has really been um, about localizing that fever, but also to, to remember that that child with malaria is not having just malaria, yeah. can have a meningitis. I've treated it before a seven year old who fell at the pitch had a meningitis, but when we did the BS, it was, uh, positive that's uh, yes, so and people did not look for the meningitis. So it's a very important thing to, to treat the malaria but also look for the other accompanying. Um, they wanted the, 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 the participants are asking for the corrections, the for the corrections to the yeah. questions. <laughs> yes. We are going to be posting the, the correct answers and our experts to give comments on the questions. <laughs> and for now, I posted another poll which will help us assess the session. How it went. <laughs> Please respond as they give the So, you want us to give comments to the question? Yeah. I don't know what questions you had, but there's one that I put of a child presenting to the OPD. I think at a law facility health center three or so. Uh, and I think I need to get to the questions. Maybe you can do as I look for the questions. Yes, Dr. Ronald, forgive us, we had <laughs> forgotten you can yeah, you can make your your, your, your remarks. Uh, thank you so much, my fellow panelists, uh, Professor Chiguli, uh, Ms. Annette, uh, the moderator, Dr. Businje, uh, and the organizers, uh, Francis Shah and Ibra, and also to our listeners, uh, You have been uh, a great support, and I've also picked a lot of things. Same way, I expect us we take it and put it in chance. So, um, the post test is currently on your screens, and it's displaying the correct answers. I see there was a lot of issues, especially with number one. Maybe we can start there. It read, a two-year-old child is brought uh, to a Kiso Health Center 3 with a history of fever for one day. The nursing aid at the reception area records body weight of 11 kilograms and accelerated to child 37.5 at degrees Celsius. The following statement is true regarding uh, further management of this child. And uh, most of the people chose uh, between RBT, uh, the next step would be RBT and the leukemia for malaria to be done immediately. Well, uh, the others chose uh, the next step in the management of this child is to ask the caretaker about the presence of... Uh, so let me... general danger. And the presence of general danger signs in this patient. And uh, I see actually more uh, about 49 chose A, while about 40 chose D. The correct answer is D there, and uh, maybe Professor can comment on that one. Yeah, I think that's where we started. These children who come in walking uh, or who are brought, whatever the complaint is, whatever the problem is, we should actually ask about the presence of a general danger sign before we go to tackle what has brought them. Because then this will guide
how we are managing, but also it tells us which children will need further referral. Even when you go through the guidelines, we'll share the link. If a child has any general danger sign, when you are classifying the illness for whatever symptom, it is in the severe classification. So we should look for those. We should not go straight away to do RDT or to, to do the fever. But it's good that a big percentage was also able to give that answer. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, question number two. Uh, when a six-month-old child is referred to the acute care unit in Mulago with a diagnosis of severe malaria, uh, the following statement is not true regarding management of this child on arrival. And uh, I see most shows a queen, queen in infusion of uh, 10 milligrams per kg hourly for the, the first time for severe malaria oh. in children. Oh, and I think that was the answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So the, the next one was the following the treatment option for fever. And uh, I see uh, this one you know, go through, need to go through it. Uh, about 77% was the right answer because followed that strongly. The last one read a nurse in the emergency department is carrying one infant who has a two day history of vomiting and an elevated temperature. This is the The nurse recognized as the most reliable indicator of fluid loss. And uh, the correct answer was body weight. Um, any comments from our panelists about this? Well, we realize that body weight is a very vital parameter in the management and care of children in general. Everything is guided by the child's body weight. If they lose weight, okay, it, it's a very prompt indicator in deviation from their usual state or from the health state as compared to skin integrity, which most of the people chose. Okay, thank you. And I should say that uh, for, for the number two, uh, there was a problem with the question and uh, I apologize for that. I wanted to bring out that uh, on arrival, assessment and management of the airways. Yes. A breathing should be done. So the been that true. But uh, uh yeah since I really um uh, in my head I, I wrote it the other way around. It's also learning learning point to me to do the thing early and read for so <laughs> I apologize <laughs> for that. But it that tells us how, how quickly we can make instead yeah. even in the management of patients that's why the guidelines guide us and having someone else to say you know check this dose check on this someone say that we should work as teams thank you everyone at this point i would like to request all of us to uh, turn on our video so that we can take a few screenshots on our videos. The camera getting all over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see Mr. Simon Oriuko, thank you for joining in with the Yumbe Reaps team. You could maybe say something as we take our screenshots, in case you have anything to communicate. Mr. Ambodia Emmanuel, I see your hand is raised. Anything you want to communicate as we close the session? So 
our next session will be in two weeks' time. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you. We'll also be sharing the links uh, for the different resources that our panelists have shared today. So be on your watch out for that. And uh, thank you very much. I see Miss Auma Winfred from Masaka. Thank you for the excellent work midweek. I know you had a tough week with the accident. Uh, thank you very much. Would you want to be to say one or two? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Hi from Masaka, Regional Fire Hospital. Actually, I'm at home, but on. Uh, greetings to the panelists, uh, those who are viewing the, the, the Zoom, those in Masaka. My mother is on in Imbare. She enjoys more despite her age. She's a she's a health worker, and uh, yeah, that is that. So we also getting much. greetings from Ghana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, who are lo locked on yeah. in the chat, and we have received a CPD link for those who are asking. Okay, everyone. So have a nice week. See you in two weeks. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.